So, what do we do in practice? Uh, the simple approach is to calculate the upper bound. This is known as the expected value of perfect information. So this is where I'm, well, I want to be leading you in this, in this exercise. So the expected value of perfect information is totally hypothetical. It does not exist, but it simplifies the analysis and gives you an upper bound, which is useful because we can definitely exclude some tests if they don't meet our, if they are, um, exceed the upper bound of the possible value. So the concept is, that there is a perfect test which exactly which event is going to occur. I will call this, I am calling this a Cassandra machine. The Greek mythology, not that anybody should necessarily know it, um, is that this lady called Cassandra who had the gift, so to speak, of always seeing what the future would be and with the curse that nobody would ever believe her. It was all about the, uh, um, the battle for Troy, um, and she could predict that somebody would die, but nobody would believe her, and the, so on. So that was the thing, that she could predict absolutely. So this is the Cassandra machine, that it, it, it predicts absolutely. Now, of course, that is, does not exist, but what is the benefit of it? So, the Cassandra machine is this black box which predicts exactly what test result will occur. It produces the best possible information. Therefore, I mean, it's absolutely true. So if you had the best possible information, that is, if you ended up with no uncertainty, you could make the best decisions and you would have the maximum gain over the decision you'd make without the information. Therefore, it gives you the upper limit on the value of the test. So what we can do if we can't get the real value, we can at least set some limits on it. And this is what the Cassandra machine, this hypothetical thing does. The further beauty of it is that the calculation for this expected value of perfect information is almost trivial. The first time you try to do it, you'll flounder around a bit because you're not used to it. But basically, it's a very simple um, device and is pretty transparent. So let me give you an example. So uh, remember, this is the raincoat problem that you're getting up in the morning and should you decide to take the raincoat or not, there may be a chance of rain, uh, rain or no rain, as in the diagram, uh, there's a uh, prior assessment, the probability is 0.4 or 0.6 of rain or no rain. And there is these values of the situation in the end of five minus two minus 10 and four values that I've invented just to give us numbers to play with. But um, uh, that's the original problem. Now, uh, just to set ourselves back into this con context, uh, what the better choice at this point is what? So how do we remind you how it is? If we take the raincoat, which is the top decision, we have a 0.4 chance of having five, which is averages to two. We have a 0.6 chance of uh, getting a minus um, two, which is um, a minus 1.2, two minus 1.2 is 0 0.8. Conversely, if I don't take the raincoat, I have a probability of four of the minus 10, that's minus four, a probability of 0.6 of four, two points, um, 2.4, so it's a negative number. So my best uh, choice is to take the raincoat, right? So I hope that you're all now back into this particular groove. Now, so uh, the setup for the probabilities uh, for the EVPI. So it's either going to say it's going to rain or not rain. That is a perfect machine. You press the button, say truth, please. And it'll say Cassandra machine says rain. Or it will say the contrary because I've only given it two choices. Now, what are the probabilities that are going to say that? Well, your best estimate of these probabilities is what you have started with before. 
you thought there was a 40% chance of getting rain. So 40% of the time it's going to tell you it's going to rain. And conversely, so that you, a priori, you have your best estimates for the value of the outcome is what your prior else were. Now, in general, once you know what the resolution of the uncertainty is, you will, the best decision is pretty obvious. If you knew it would rain, uh, going back here, if you knew it was going to rain, you're comparing five versus 10, well, you take the raincoat. If you knew for sure it wasn't going to rain, you compare minus two and four, and you don't take the raincoat. So the, uh, you don't have to do any complicated calculations of the possibilities. Uh, you would have a probability of 0.4 that it would take the raincoat to get it to five, and the probability of 0.6 of not taking, uh, of not taking the raincoat and getting a result of four. So you can write down your best decisions uh, pretty automatically. Now, um, the expected value after this case, as I'm running this calculation of uh, doing the 0.4 times the result of five and the 0.6 of four, I'm, your perfect value is 4.4. Now, the expected value of perfect information is the value of the increment, not the value that at the, at the end of it, it's the value of the increment. That is, what did you get from it? So the expected value after the test was 4.4, the expected value before the test was 0 0.8. The expected value of perfect information in this case is uh, 3.6. All right. So the the nice thing about it is the prior the expected value of simple uh, perfect information is simple to calculate. The prior probability must equal the probability uh, that you of the perfect test result. Once you've run the perfect test, the posterior probabilities are either zero or one. They either this happens or it doesn't happen. There's no doubt about that. Once you know that there's a whole lot of zero probabilities on, and there's a one probability, you know what you're gonna choose. And pretty much you can uh, write the expected value of perfect information formula directly. There's no need to use Bayes' theorem. So Robert, since you've asked a question before, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but since you've been doing it and I'm showing you this, um, why did you not use this approach if you, if you knew about it or did, maybe you didn't know about it? So what, what is a, um, can you have a discussion about this please? Or your response to this? If I'm not embarrassing you or putting you on the spot, which I don't mean to do. <laughs> no, that's fine. I, I actually haven't heard of this uh perfect information idea. Um, oh. Yeah, so that, that's probably the main reason I didn't use it. But the other one was, like at, at Chevron, we, we kind of have a defined procedure in terms of how we justify value of information. So yeah. that, that procedure was utilizing the conditional probabilities. Uh, but myself, I was personally a bit uncomfortable because it, like you were saying, it's hard to figure out what the percentages would be for either a good, medium, or bad outcome. So it, it, was, it was pretty challenging to actually apply. And I think at the end, people weren't super confident in it, like you were saying. Well, um, I think that that's right. So yeah. um, about 30 or 40 years ago, I mean, I can, I'm old enough to remember that, there was a phase where decision analysis really, was really taught a lot in business schools, which has since gone by. Uh, and companies picked up on that because it was certainly better than not looking at uncertainty. And it was nice to have this notion of a Bayes rule, Bayes theorem. And uh, people thought of themselves either as being Bayesian or not. And so there's a whole history about why this was th the correct uh, improvement and approach. Not thinking about the fact that these other issues, the probabilities, the associated probabilities and the probability of occurrence and so forth, which are the part of that special factor for the uh, operation of the Bayes theorem are just basically hard to get, hard to document and hard to prove so that 
I think that you are reflecting, which may exist elsewhere. I'm not pointing a finger at Chevron, but um, that they have an established, they have a decision analysis manual, they have an approach, a procedure, and so forth. But uh, it doesn't um, it doesn't really fly. And as you suggest, that a lot of people don't believe in it. And I would be one of those if I were in uh, Chevron, uh, is because I it's such a spongy. The calculation is correct, but the, the the data are spongy, and it's a guy go garbage in, garbage out kind of a situation. I think so. I understand that you're encouraged to do that, and this uh, EVPI is trivial mathematically. I mean, you, you don't have to be smart or think through the complexities, but it gives you an upper bound. And that is the useful aspect of it. And I th thank you for noting that it is not the usual way of approaching things, um, uh, but I think that it's a, a reasonable way to do it and productive. And I would encourage you to take the message back. Now, I can see that they're not gonna change the procedures for you. And so what people do in the case of the procedure is wrong, they sort of try to ignore it, which is what you reflected. 